Well, good morning, church. We're so glad to be here with you this morning in worship. If you are able, would you stand as we read our call to worship together this morning? It comes from Psalm 29, verses 1 through 2, and it says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our soul shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful. Oh, my soul, 
In Matthew 25, Jesus calls us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and care for the sick. This mission is as urgent today in Georgia as it was 2,000 years ago in Galilee. We are called to be his representatives, bringing light to a broken world. We are called to let them see Jesus. 12.7% of Georgians live below the poverty line. In urban areas, the rate is even higher. Families struggle to provide food, clothing, and shelter. But Georgia Baptists are making a difference, offsetting health care costs through health clinic ministries from Claxton to Cartersville. Mothers in Georgia are receiving essential care at crisis pregnancy centers. Georgia Baptists support these women through prenatal care, transportation services, parenting education, and emotional and spiritual support. Over half of Georgia's third graders cannot read at grade level, setting them up for a lifetime of challenges. But child literacy programs like Read Georgia are happening in schools from Americas to Alpharetta, providing tutoring and mentoring to open doors for a brighter future. Human trafficking is a devastating reality in Georgia. Children and teens are exploited and trapped in this modern day slavery. But ministries from Albany to Atlanta directly reach the traffic, while other Georgia Baptists serve the incarcerated, bringing hope and healing to all with the gospel. Thousands of children in Georgia are without stable, loving homes. We can provide these children with the care and support they need by becoming foster parents, supporting foster families, and creating a culture in our churches where foster kids know they are loved. Refugees are in every community in Georgia. Those who have fled their homes due to violence and persecution are seeking safety and a new beginning. Georgia Baptists provide housing, job training, and language classes while empowering Bible studies and worship in their native languages. It doesn't stop there. We build strong communities by planting churches where legacies are being rewritten through the power of the gospel. Your involvement in the Mission Georgia offering makes a real difference. 
Your support provides the resources needed to follow Jesus' mission while we carry out His method, holding fast to the promise that He is with us. Together, we will bring the love of Jesus to every corner of our state. We will let them see Jesus. So let's unite in prayer and action. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus, serving our neighbors with compassion and generosity. Join us in the Mission Georgia statewide missions offering and be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Baptist Church of McDonough. We're so glad you're here. We are one of those 45,000-plus participating Southern Baptist churches who, from time to time, we will pull our monies together uh, to create a, a better opportunity for everyone to reach people in certain communities. This month of September, we're raising funds to give to Georgia Baptists to do the kind of things that you saw on the screen just a moment ago, and it is a wonderful, beautiful thing to see churches cooperating together for the greater good, amen? We're one of those churches, and so we pray that this September you'll consider what you might give. Our goal for September is $6,000. That's what we would love to be able to give in our state missions offering to Georgia Baptists to help them accomplish the stuff that we alone couldn't do but together as Southern Baptists are able to accomplish like that. And so we want you to be aware of the good work that is going on through Georgia Baptists and the monies that you give each month. Did you know a portion of the monies that you give each month, month goes to Georgia Baptists, goes to Southern Baptists for the work in Georgia, North America, and around the world? It's a beautiful thing to see happen it's a one of a kind mission sending organization too, by the way. No other denomination or group of people do that. By the way, if you'd like to know more about what's happening with Georgia Baptist today and in coming weeks, we will have this guide. It's actually a prayer guide. I read through this. This thing is really, really good this year. Sometimes I felt, eh, but this one is really fantastic, chock full of a lot of things that are happening, some statistics that I think will be a little mind-blowing, but more importantly, how we as Georgia Baptists, as Southern Baptists, at First Baptist through Georgia, I don't anyway, what we can do to help meet a need and to make a difference, not only in our community, but in Georgia and the world, so... I hope you'll consider reading through this, using this as a prayer guide through the month of September, and reminding yourself, you might even want to take yours, they're in your worship guides today, you might even want to take yours and just write $6,000 goal, and commit to praying what it is you might be able to do to help us reach our goal. You know what, it might be $6. I'm going to give six out of the 6000 Thank you very much. Because if it came down to it and we collected 5,994, uh, 5, I know, thank you, I'm bad at math. Uh, <laughs> you were the one that took us to the goal. Do you see? Uh, maybe you'll give $60, maybe you'll give $600. You know, maybe somebody here today wants to just get us all off the hook and write. No, uh, we don't want you to do that. I said, why not? Well, we want everybody to participate. And when you give a little, a little to, a little is, uh, is extremely um, relative, is it not? What we consider very little, uh, some of my dear friends that I've met in Ethiopia would consider to be just unbelievable amounts of money. And so consider that, you know, what you might give. We're going to bring our men forward now to collect the offering. And we're going to pray together. Let's do that. Father, we come to you today thanking you for, uh, oh God, thanking you for your love and grace. We, we thank you for the blessing of having a church family where we can gather each Sunday, we can gather midweek, we can gather whenever we want to gather. Just help to meet a need to carry a friend up to the hospital to see a loved one or 
over to the grocery store, down the street, whatever it is, to go meet a need in the community. Bake a bunch of cookies and take them over to a new neighbor. Get involved in one of these wonderful ministries through Georgia Baptist. I think of our own ministries through First Baptist. How last evening a group of our members, thank you God, they, they wanted to reach the international, student, uh, international teachers in Henry County. Thank you God for bringing that wonderful group of folks together. We think about the difference that our church makes in this community and Georgia Baptists make in the state of Georgia. We've got a long way to go. Oh God, we know time is slipping away, but God, I pray as we think about this part of the faith, where we give back a little bit to further a great cause. I pray we'll really consider what it is we might do to be a part of this offering. I thank you for the generosity of your people at First Baptist always. We we are so blessed. But help us to give and give big. might go to a greater work. Help us, Lord, to unite not only as Baptists, but also as believers around the world. We have a world of people to reach. We need you, and we... We thank you for sending us. We answer the call and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Church, would you stand and join us as we sing this morning? Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Shout Jesus in the darkness over For my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is fire. Break every stone.
more time with your voices, we exalt thee. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. goodness and your faithfulness to us. You are so holy and perfect, and we are just so grateful for who you are, for the sacrifice that Jesus made when he died on the cross to save us. We thank you. As we continue through worship, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us that our hearts and our minds would be open and ready to receive your word this morning. We pray for Pastor Charles as he um, brings your word and as he um, explains this vision. Lord, as we continue our series on building your church, we just ask that you would be here in this place, Lord, and continue um, to speak to us as we worship you. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Thanks to our worship team this morning for leading us in worship. Leslie and I saw something very beautiful the other day. We were at Laurel Park visiting John Brown, and Naomi was there, and we were talking and laughing, having a great time, and it came time for us to leave, and so I asked John if he wouldn't mind just praying over him, and he said, by all means. John was sharing a room with another gentleman who was sitting in his wheelchair just on the other side of the curtain. And as I began to pray, I didn't know this because I was just too focused in on praying over John, but uh, Naomi and Leslie certainly noticed, and John said later that he had heard as well. Um, But the gentleman um, who seemed to have been on the phone talking loudly as if he couldn't hear while we were just standing around talking, uh, began to sing while, when I started praying. And uh, I, I recognized somebody singing when I was praying, but that's really all. But Leslie said he started singing, I Surrender All. And so we thought that was beautiful and cute, and we left. And um, we're almost right when we got home. It was either Naomi or Tammy called. Huh, Naomi? Naomi called and said, you're not going to believe this, but that gentleman passed away right after he sang that song. It was right after you had left. And uh, wow, that was, that was a trip, that's for sure. Oh, heavens, but we pray that he surrendered himself into the arms of Jesus that day. Whoever he was, we wish you well. I would love for you to turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 8 and Luke chapter 9. That's in the Gospel of Luke. The first first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the third book of the New Testament, Dr. Luke writes a biography of Jesus' life. It's called a gospel, though, because it's more than just the story of Jesus' life. It is a message 
from God himself to the world. If you're new to us, we have, by the way, we welcome you here. If you're new to us, I did not properly welcome our guests, so I apologize for that. But thank you so much for being here. I met Charity earlier. What a adorable young lady. And uh, if you're new to us and I didn't get to meet you, I'm so sorry. I hope that I get to before you leave here today. But if you are new, take a, a, a Connect card in the pew rack in front of you and fill that out for us if you don't mind. Or you can get your phone and you can put it up to the QR code and you can just sign in digitally. But we would love to get a record of your visit. If you're, if you're listening in today, by the way, we want to welcome you and thank you for listening in on our worship service online. We hope you have a great experience with us as well. Uh, we are in the middle of a conversation we've been having on the church and how it is that we can best reach our community and the world. That's one of the reasons I love being a Southern Baptist so much is that when we talk about reaching our community and the world, we have an instant partnership with other Southern Baptist churches. We live in a world of changing values and norms and we live in a community experience tremendous change as well. Much of that change is for the good. And what I might consider not good is just the fact that it's happening so fast. And what I might consider the not good is, is that it's, the changes that are happening mean that you and me are going to have to learn some new ways to minister in the community. And we don't like being taken out of our comfort zone, do we? So it, it, uh, in fact, the latest Henry Magazine, which I brought today, not only are there some great information here about Georgia Baptist, but there's some amazing information in here about the dramatic changes going on in the life of Henry County. I really think every one of you needs to go find this book. They're free. They're all over town. Um, in fact, if everybody, maybe after church, we'll all walk over to... Um, <laughs> no, we can't do that, can we? Uh, and we'll all just walk in and grab a book and leave. No, let's don't do that. But they do have them at Grits if you want, if you want to grab one of those. Um, I'm not sure they'll appreciate me saying that. But if you stay and eat lunch, I'm sure they would. Um, no, so um, the latest demographics for Henry County, they, they, they pose, I guess... A challenge for you and me. You know, we've had a 200 year history of our church alone in the community of, of McDonough and Henry County, and those changes that we've seen take place in the last 200 years have been long and slow, like slow motion. And now the changes we're seeing in Henry County are, are moving at the speed of light. And so it poses some challenges for us. Our leadership team at this moment is rewriting some of our long-range planning goals as we speak. And we uh, will be presenting them to our fellowship in, in just uh, the end of the month of September. Hang on to your hats. What is it? that we are to be as the church. I thought of that beautiful story of the group of children touring the worship center sanctuary one Sunday morning, uh, which was part of their Sunday school class, and the teacher was walking them around, and they were looking at um, uh, the pulpit and the choir loft, and they were looking at the technology, and they were looking at all the beautiful, ornate stuff about the old sanctuary, and they were looking at the stained glass windows, and they had just such a good time. And this particular church had four beautiful stained glass windows and each one was uh, reserved for one of the Gospels. Have you ever seen that in a church before? It's pretty common, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they each have their own little stained glass look. And they each have their own little stained glass Bible. And, you know, they, they're, they're representative, of course, of the life story of Jesus and the difference he's made in our lives and the difference he made in their lives as the gospel has been taken to the world. There's all kinds of imagery and messaging there, but the teacher gets the kids back to class. 
And she's asking them all kinds of questions. And she told them that those four men in the stained glass were disciples. And she says, do you guys remember that we saw the disciples? Who are the disciples? And this beautiful little girl, without hesitation, said, those are the guys that let all the light shine through. And that's right. That's what we as the church, more pointedly, more directly, we're not just to let the light shine through. You and I are to be letting the light shine out, right? You remember that book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? Somebody wrote another book called Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Sunday School. And uh, one of those things was let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Remember that old VBS song? Truer words were never spoken. That's really part of what it is you and I are to be, and I think, from, and it takes from the mouths of babes. This young girl was right in so many ways. The church is the only place anymore, by the way, where the light still shines in the darkness. That's one of the role of the church, and it becomes quite easily when a community and world is enshrouded in darkness, it's easy for the light to shine brighter, like a lighthouse calling ships in to safe harbor. You and I, as we preach the gospel, as we share our faith, as we let our light shine through, yes, but let our light shine out, what happens is, is we make an impact in the world around us, our very own mission field. I like what happens, and I want to take us through the story of Luke chapter 8 and 9. Here we see what amounts to really nothing more than, that's saying a lot though, but it's nothing more than a day in the life of Jesus' public ministry. And look at what happens. So many Amazing things happen in just a short period of time. In, in Luke chapter 8, Jesus is traveling town and to town. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, we see in verse 1. And he's sharing them some amazing principles. He's talking about the sower of the seed, remember, who scatters the seed. And some falls along the path, some gets trampled on. Some the birds eat up, some falls on rocky soil, and and so it never really takes root. Others fall among the thistles, and so the thistles sort of choke out the plant. And, And then Jesus says, but other seed fell on good soil. Right now my wife is in in the midst of this wonderful project in the backyard. We recently remodeled our backyard and we put in these massive planters because my wife wants to be a farmer one day when she grows up. And I'm not even kidding and I'm not even going to tell you how much money we have spent on this for a few dollars worth of vegetables. (laughs) But she has had so much fun doing it, and it has been the joy of her family to watch her in all of her glory. She even went out and bought her some overhauls, as uh, Jerry Clower, the old Mississippi comedian, used to say, bought her a pair of overhauls. The only thing we don't have is a straw cowboy hat and one of those long uh, wheat, you know, with the little things on the end that she can... You know, but otherwise, she's having a great time. And what's so beautiful about, you know, the, the stories that Jesus often told of the farmers sowing seed and, and the, the good fruit and the bad fruit, and he tells all these amazing stories that are so apropos to people in that society, but even in our society, we still understand that, you know, you put a seed in the ground and then for, for the example of corn, the stalk comes up, right? And at some point in due season, it begins to produce corn. Uh, like a, a cob of corn. Usually there's like maybe two, maybe three, I guess maybe four uh, ears of corn on a stalk. That'd be a great, that'd be a great stalk, by the way. And uh, f- from one seed, you have this cob of corn, which 
can produce four, five, six hundred kernels of corn. You, you ever, my grandmother used to do it this way when we would pop popcorn. We didn't have Jiffy Pop and we didn't have microwaves and all that nonsense. And so she would put uh, little kernels of corn into a pan, get it really hot, fill it with butter, and she'd put the top on and you could hear it. Pop, 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 pop. And she shook it around, which I always thought she was fighting with all the popping of the popcorn, but I think she was just moving it around, right? And, and then she would open the top. And to me, that was just amazing. From those little kernels of corn came this big bowl of popcorn. And it all began with that little seed. I love that story Jesus tells about the mustard seed, which was just about the smallest seed you could find in those days in the, in the, in the Middle East where Jesus was. And he would say, all you need is the faith of a mustard seed. You don't, you don't need big faith. You just need a little faith. And as you exercise your faith and as you see me honor the faith that you're exercising, uh, it'll give you a little more faith. It'll spur you on to greater faith. And then I'll bless you even more. And there'll be this beautiful thing happening. What will happen is Jesus will see how serious we are as a church about our community and the world. And Jesus will say, man, you guys believe this stuff. You guys are preparing yourself for something really special. I'm going to allow you the increase. Because you're acting on your faith. Jesus tells the stories of the lamp on the stand. This is where we go back to this idea of shining our light, right? Jesus says in chapter 8 of Luke, verse 16, No one lights a lamp and then hides it in a clay jar or puts it under the bed. Instead, they put it up on a stand so that those who come in can see the light, can enjoy the illumination of the light. We read on in Luke chapter 8, and Jesus is calming the storm. Remember, he's saying to them once again, why are you doubting me, guys? Where is your faith, he says in verse 25 of chapter 8. And then he restores a demon-possessed man. It's a really wild story. And we don't have time. We, I recently preached on it, but we don't have time to, to get into that today. Jesus heals uh, Jairus' daughter who had died, right? He heals a sick woman, the woman who had the issue of blood. We read about that in Luke chapter 8. And here in chapter 9, which is really our focal passage today, in the first six verses, I wanted us to see what Jesus does next. I call this passage, by the way, this is Pastor Charles, purely Pastor Charles. It has nothing to do with theology necessarily or biblical truth. I think this is the beta test for the church. I think what's happening right here is for the very first time, and we know in Matthew 16 that Jesus is talking to his disciples about the church, but I think Jesus is beta testing the church and his followers as to how they are going to follow his call to go take the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the other ends of the earth. And he says right here, in verse 1 of chapter 9, the gospel of Luke, Jesus calls the twelve together. He gives them power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. Why does he give them authority to do that? Well, because they've just seen that. And he wants them to go and do likewise. He wants them to extend his reach in his day and life. He could only be in one place in one time because the eternal God, the Son, had poured himself into humanity for that 33 years of his life. So he gathers around him 12 when Jesus dies, is raised from the dead and ascends to the Father in heaven, Jesus sends out the twelve. The opportunity was that twelve different directions could have the gospel gone. Jesus sends them out two by two. Proclaiming the kingdom of God. 
and healing the sick, he tells them, take nothing for your journey. You won't need anything. This is a faith venture. No staff, no bag, no money, no bread, no extra shirt. Whatever your house you enter, stay there until you leave the town. And if the people don't welcome you there, leave their town. Don't get mad. Don't worry about it. Just shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them and get on your way. They set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. They had great success in this beta test of the church. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 28? We know that Jesus says in Matthew 16, I am going to build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Further on in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, Now I want you to go into all the world. I want you to preach the gospel. Baptizing new converts in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And I'm giving you the authority, my authority to go, and I'm going to be with you until I return again. You can hear echoes of what Jesus has told them in Luke 9. You can hear echoes of that in his great commission call that we read in Matthew 28 that I just shared with you, right? Jesus moving from town to town sharing the message of salvation, healing the sick, raising the dead, teaching the followers and disciples the truths by which they are to live. In chapter 9, he's sending them out. This is going to be the template, I think, for the church elders and leaders. We're going to go into all the world. Very quickly, I want to share with you three character qualities that I see here. This might be something for you and me to consider, that we are to also exhibit these. We are to kind of take on, embrace these character qualities in our lives, kind of build them up. You might have them naturally. Some of you do. That I know of. Some of you do that I don't know of. But I've seen many of these qualities in action. The first of which I see here is that if we're going to be Christ church, we have to be a courageous church. I call this sermon the 3C church because I'm not clever at at sermon titles, as you know. And uh, each of these begin with the letter C, and I, I think I wanted to make it easy for you. I, th- the Lord wants us to be a courageous church. Remember what he told Joshua when Joshua was about to lead the people across the Jordan and into the promised land to take back the property that God had swore to give to Joshua and the Israelites' forefathers? They're finally occupying that territory. God says to Joshua, Joshua, I'm going to give you great success, but you're going to have to be strong and courageous. I'm not just going to give this to you. You're going to have to go and fight for it. You're going to have to trust me that when I say to you, this is the way I want you to go about your business, this is the way I want you to go about taking back the property I swore to your forefathers, you're going, it's going to be unique at times, so you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to have faith in me. And I don't want you to deviate from my plan at all. Don't turn from the right. Don't turn from the left. Don't deviate at all. Just trust me. Follow me. Lead my people. And then he says, and he says it three times, be strong and courageous. And at the last one he goes, Joshua, you've got to be strong, very courageous. It's almost like God is trying to convince him, isn't it? Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not even prevail against my church. That's his church on the offense. 
That's his church doing such great work and creating such havoc in the evil spiritual world that exists and, and the difference that the gospel and the love of Jesus is making through the church that we end up marching to the very gates of hell itself. That's the kind of church, church uh, Jesus imagined. That's how courageous Jesus envisioned the church. We have the message of healing, the message of hope, the message of life, the message of eternity, the message of love and grace, the message of peace with God and our fellow man. We have the message of life Jesus said, I've come that you might have life in all of its abundance, meaning joy. He said, I'm going to bless you by giving you my truth, and that if you'll live by my truth, you will have my blessings in abundance. But you're going to have to take it on with courage. Heralding the good news in a lost and hurting world is not going to be for the faint of heart. If you're going to make a difference, you're going to have to do it my way. I think that's what we see Dr. Luke doing here, by the way, in Luke chapter 8 and 9. He's cataloging, he's detailing the life of Jesus, but not just to say, oh, by the way, here's what he looked like and here's the stuff he did and take it or leave it if you want. He's deriving everybody to a point, and originally, by the way, Dr. Luke wrote this gospel to drive his friend Theophilus to a decision. Early on in Luke, we see it, right? Theophilus, hey, my dear friend, let me tell you what I've done here. I've done the work for you. I've gathered all the evidence that I could find about Jesus. And I want to tell you his life story. And I want to tell you that if you'll believe on him, you too will have the gift of eternal life. Dr. Luke also writes the book of Acts, which comes after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The activities of the early church, Dr. Luke goes on later in his life to say, I think I should catalog this as well. I think I should make sure that everybody knows what the church has been doing. How... Jesus made the difference in their lives and how they're carrying on the message of Jesus in their world, in their day and time, and that church age mission, my dear friend, continues in our day and time, 2,000 years later. It's like, oh, Pastor Charles, 2,000 years later, when is this guy going to come back? 2,000 years that is so long. Is he ever going to come back? Has he forgotten about us? Was this kind of a mad joke from a mad God? No. The Bible says that the God of eternity is in a time frame where a thousand years is just like a day. And a day is just like a thousand years. On the timeline, when it comes to God, from the perspective of eternity, it's as if a couple of days have gone by. You and I see timeline very, time very linearly. It's kind of how we were, I don't know, kind of uh, programmed uh, by the world around us to see time. But maybe time doesn't exist that way. I mean, time is, is very relative. A day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. Christ will return in the perfect time. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. And in the perfection of time, God will. A couple of years ago, I was preaching on, the, on, on being a courageous church. My three points that Sunday morning, I know you all remember, but uh, <laughs> was number one, that we act on the promises of God. That Jesus said, I am going to build my church, and you and I act on that. We believe God is going to build it. Again, we're in a time 
Our community is rapidly changing. We're in a time where we've got to rediscover who we are and how it is we can, our expression of Jesus' church can reach a new community rapidly changing and growing and developing. It's a good thing, but it creates a challenge for us. Like the sons of Issachar in the Old Testament who helped David because they knew the times and what Israel should do. They weren't the fighters. They weren't the front line uh, guys that were grappling with the swords. They weren't the slingers. They weren't the guys with the bows and arrows. They were the guys in headquarters looking at a map going, here's what I believe we should do next. They were creating strategies to best win uh, for the people of Israel and their King David in battle. You and I, as followers of Jesus, we're battling not flesh and blood. We are battling principalities and the powerful forces of darkness itself. That's why this imagery that we often see in the Gospels of carrying the light of the Gospel of letting our light shine and not just shine through but shine out is so important. We act on the promises of God because God, because Christ said, I will build my church. And then we activate the power of God where the very gates of hell itself will not be able to prevail against Christ's church. The final thing I said was we then ascend to the purposes of God. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses. When we begin to take on the life God calls us to take on, when we put away the past of the old life and we accept the, the prospect of, of the great future God has for us, we ascend to greater purposes. What about a compassionate church? Running out of time here. The compassionate church is a place where people can make kind of, um, I don't know, like a soft landing when they need to, where their, their life has been, they've been struggling in their life and they come and they're looking for something. Uh, maybe you reach out to them, you know, your light is shining out and they see something special and they want to make some dramatic change in their life and they need a place to be able to do that. <clears throat> Jesus said, I didn't come to make the well better. I, I came to heal the sick, the blind, the lame, the deaf, the dead. I've come to help those who are in need. It's a, it's a compassion that we must have. Really, maybe more so than courage. Even though being a Christian in our day and time in the Western world is facing a lot of opposition, let's just say. We're seeing a lot of opposition to Israel right now. Wait until that opposition finds its voice and its, its will to turn on the church, my dear friends. Oh, then you're going to have a fight on your hands. And I hope a revival comes long before that happens. But we're not fighting flesh and blood. We're not fighting other people. We're not fighting their philosophy or their agenda or their program or their way of life or their political party. Set all of that nonsense aside and realize that we're trying to help people find the hope of everlasting life through Jesus who saved us. And if we're going to do that at all, it's going to take a lot of compassion from us, not a fight. People need to know what we are for, not the things we're against. 
And they need to see love in our hearts. A compassionate church is where people can start all over again and not feel threatened at all or feel like an outcast or or feel like that there's not people there when they do who are going to rally around them, but they know that's what they're going to find when they get there. uh, Louise Fletcher Tarkington wrote, I wish there was some wonderful place called the land of beginning again where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all of our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat on the floor and never put on again. There are lost and hurting people looking for that. They're hoping they can still find that in the church. God help them if they can't. More importantly, God help us if we weren't the right representation of a loving, gracious God to someone who was looking for forgiveness and salvation. Amen? A final thought is a contagious church, and we've run out of time on this, but church fellowships that believe God is up to something great in their lives and in their church are usually where that church becomes contagious. (laughs) Right now, so much of the church is a contagion, you know? I don't want any of that. You just, just avoid that. But no, the Lord wants us to be a contagious, infectious. I know that that sounds that can sound so wrong, but the Lord just wants us to be a place that's irresistible to the world because my goodness, who has ever thought that the love of Jesus who, whether he was a liar, a lunatic, or truly the Lord, which we believe, he's dying on a cross out of his Unending love for humanity. Even unbelievers can see the beauty of that. But are we an expression of the sacrifice of Christ to a world that can't forgive itself? It's hurting. It's trying everything at all to find any purpose and meaning to life. only to find how bankrupt those ideas are. The the contagious uh, must not be built on anything but on Christ alone. The contagious church, rather. (laughs) I printed that out wrong. (laughs) Sorry about that. The contagious church must not be built on anything but Christ alone. Our eagerness, in other words, is a reflection of the things we love. If we're eager to share our faith, people see that. Man, he believes it. He wants me to know it. There must be some truth to it. I'm going to give it a listen. See if it makes any sense. Going into the world. In the Staunton Church, just outside of Wales in England, a stone engraving over the double doors of the church reads this. This church was raised in honor of Sir Robert Shirley, whose singular praise was this. To have done the best of things in the worst of times. I kind of feel like that's where we are right now with the church. A church that needs to be more courageous, most definitely. A church that needs to be a lot more compassionate, absolutely. More contagious, more irresistible, no doubt. A church that goes on to fulfill its mission to the community and the world and beat against the gates of hell trying to save lost sinners. Would you pray with me? In other words, with the world at its worst, the church must be at its best. 
Maybe we're there, maybe we're close, maybe we're nowhere. Anywhere near where we should be, but there's always today. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. You could come to Jesus right now and say, Oh God, I'm a sinner, save my soul. I want to give you my life this very day and ask you to come into my world and forgive me and save me and heal me, make me brand new. I believe, God, you sent Jesus to die to save me, and I'm trusting him. I'm believing you. I'm giving you my life by faith. My dear friends, if you meant that with sincerity in your heart, then according to the scripture, you've, you've come to faith in Jesus, and we celebrate with you. We think that's so amazing. There's a lot that is to take place from this moment on. As Jesus said, to go and be baptized, to go and unite with a church family where you can serve together and where you can grow in your faith. Some things you need to know, some stuff you need to learn. Character qualities you need to take on and embrace. Live out. I don't know where you are on that spiritual journey, but at each crossroad there is a it's a new set of challenges. So for some it would be to be saved, for others to be baptized, for others to grow in their faith, to for others to come and just join a Bible study class. We're starting some in the fall and on Sunday night. And we've started some others here on Sunday morning. Of course, we have our Sunday school time. What's God telling you to do? Follow him in doing so. Go as Jesus said to the disciples, go and do likewise. Follow him. Strengthen the church by accepting the challenges that lie before you as a believer in Jesus. God, that's our prayer. And praying all of it in Jesus' name, we say amen. Let's stand together, folks, very quickly. We will not tarry long, but like to come forward to pray at the altar to join our fellowship to commit to baptism or to a bible study we'll be down front to help you bill jason and i we're here to pray with you to help you in any way you need us come quickly god bless you but we want to give everyone an opportunity to respond. Maybe you're not ready to respond. Maybe one day this week you will be, though. Look, our doors are open. You can call us. You can email us. You can text us. You can drop in. Let us know how we can help you this week. Would you do that? Any other messages we need to offer? Any other things going on? Next Sunday night is our... And the teachers, which you're one of those. I am? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. You, um, are going to present um, their studies. Yeah. And let us know I'm what it's all about. about. And you can sign up then. And 
Uh, we hope you come at 5.30? Yes. At 5.30 next Sunday night. Next Sunday night, 5.30 is going to be great. Yeah, I look, I'm looking forward to the classes that Brenda, our wonderful small groups director, has prepared for us, and I get to lead one. Bill, you leading one? Bill's leading one, too. Jason, you leading one? With Bill. With Bill, nice. I'm trying to embarrass somebody, but everybody <laughs> who's not leading one, I could embarrass. No. Uh, thank you guys for doing that. All right. Let's, you want to sing a song? Or we have a song to sing? We can sing the last verse. Let's do that. The That'd last awesome. verse when yeah. we've been there? Yeah. you here. We hope you have a great week. God bless.